Well, today <clears throat> we are very honored to have the 16th president of a university which is almost 200 years old. But it is really celebrating its centennial here in Foggy Bottom, like our club. When he arrived on the scene, I think it was, what, five years ago? Four and a half. Four and a half. Relations with the Foggy, Body, Foggy Bottom community <coughs> were absolutely terrible. I don't think that if the university wanted to give away its endowment to every resident of Foggy Bottom, they would have turned it down. And today, things have changed completely. The, uh, recently, they asked for local approval of a development. The Advisory Neighborhood Commission was in favor of it. The local Foggy Bottom Association, which had an absolute hate for the university, favored it. 300 local people came to speak in favor of it, and only 19 were opposed. And the reason is very simple. It's our speaker, President now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Davis, for the very kind uh, introduction, and thanks also to, uh, uh, to uh, President Davis for uh, the invitation to uh, address this group. Um, I have to tell you that uh, I first learned about the Rotary Club probably several decades ago when I was invited uh, to attend as a guest by my father-in-law, stalwart Rotarian in upstate New York, and that was when I first learned about the mission of the Rotary Club and its commitment to uh, education, particularly focused on humanitarian uh, areas around the world and uh, the scholarship programs and so on. And so I was uh, uh, delighted to be asked to uh, come before you uh, today just to make a few remarks about, uh, about some of the things we have in common, really. And of course, one of the most important things we have in common is this great capital city of which we are so much a part. And I'm very glad that, uh, that uh, Davis mentioned that we share an anniversary in common. This year, 2012, is the 100th anniversary of our arrival in our current location, which is Foggy Bottom. That's where we have our main campus. We also have some other campuses I'll talk about very briefly. But um, before that, we actually were in two previous locations. When we were first founded in 1821, we were located just above Florida Avenue on a, a strip that was a block wide and half a mile long, uh, and we were known as Columbian College at that time. Uh, and then in the, uh, after the Civil War, partly because it was a fire that burned down some of our buildings when they were being used as Civil War barracks, uh, after Civil War, we moved down to the other side of Lafayette Square from where we are now, basically 14th and H, but we didn't arrive at Foggy Bottom until 1912, which happens to be the year that the Rotary Club of Washington, D.C. was founded, so we certainly have that history in common. And when you look back over that century, the transformation both of the George Washington University and certainly the District of Columbia is pretty amazing to uh, consider. In 1912, we had just a little over 1,000 students in the entire university, making us roughly the size of a small liberal arts college. Uh, and we were located on really one strip of G Street uh, between 20th and 21st Streets. Uh, we now are a university of 25,000 students. We have 10 schools. We're located on our Foggy Bottom campus as our main location, but we also have, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to acquire the former Mount Vernon's Women's College, which is now an essential part of our uh, university where a number of our students live. And we also have uh, important academic programs located there. And we have a growing campus in Virginia near Dulles Airport at the intersection of Route 7 and 28, our science and technology campus. But we have many other locations throughout uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, all the way down to Hampton Roads, where we have a campus going back to 1958. So we've changed uh, pretty dramatically during that time. And of course, there's been equal Dramatic, uh, equally dramatic transformation of Washington, D.C. 1912, in 1912, the museums, the monuments were virtually non-existent. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial had not been constructed. The Washington Monument was, was uh, up. That had been constructed in the late 19th century. But the, um, not only were the museums not there, the cherries were just arriving. 1912 was the year that Japan sent the first shipment of, of uh, cherry trees to Washington, D.C. And of course, since that time, Washington 
has, which uh, I think the outskirts outside the city limits were almost entirely farmland uh, at that period, 1912. And of course now it's become a cosmopolitan city, an international city, a world capital, almost as much as a national capital, and also a center for the arts and intellect and science. It's interesting to reflect on the fact that uh, within about a 20 mile radius of where you're sitting right now, there are more physicists than anywhere else in the United States. I mean, if you think about that, and how often do people think of Washington, D.C. as a center of science and not just as a center of power and politics. So there's been a tremendous, a tremendous transformation. And one of the transformations that occur has occurred is that Washington has become, and again, it's not really appreciated for this, but has really become a college town. Our university, George Washington, is one of 14 members of the consortium of universities of the Washington metropolitan area. Ten of those universities are actually located in the limits of the District of Columbia. We happen to be the largest of those universities. It's altogether some 100,000 students. The, um, uh, we did a study last summer of the uh, economic impact of our universities on the capital region, and it was conducted by, a, I think, a quite a distinguished a local economist here, Stephen Fuller, who's on the faculty of uh, George Mason University. Very rigorous uh, study that was done, and the finding was that our universities account for 3% of the region's economy, and it's a more than $11 billion annual impact on the economy here. Uh, and our alumni uh, tend to remain here. And one of the interesting things that happens is that when people come to Washington, they find it a fascinating place to live. And so we've actually had the experience in our particular university that of our little more than 200,000 alumni, 75,000 of them, almost all of whom have come from outside of the Washington area, uh, remain here after they graduate and continue to work and contribute to the economy and to the life of, uh, of this capital city and the region surrounding. In fact, 15,000 of those live right here within the district limits and the others in Virginia uh, and Maryland. Well, I think that's quite a contribution that universities make to the human capital of this region. It's one of the reasons why this is the most educated region in the United States, which I think is really critical to the flourishing of our economy and to the cultural amenities that we all enjoy. And by the way, speaking of culture, um, the universities in this region account for 10,000 theater seats uh, in, in the cultural life of the region and 11 art galleries. And in fact, we're gonna add to that number uh, in a couple of years because we're building a museum on our campus which will house both the Albert Small Washingtoniana collection, really a world-class collection of materials about Washington, including George Washington's letter to Congress uh, in which he called for the creation of the Capitol in its current location. And, uh, and also the Textile Museum, which is now located in Colorado. It's gonna be moving on to our campus in just, a couple of, in just a couple of years. And I would also say that um, there are other ways that are perhaps less uh, uh, immediately tangible and less obvious to, uh, to, to uh, an economist in which uh, we contribute through volunteer activities across the city, through the uh, influence of our faculty on important policy decisions, whether it's through our School of Public Health which advises the city of, uh, of Washington on a number of its health policy issues, but also just the direct service of students who volunteer 600,000 hours in the region annually, which has been, that's been uh, priced at 18.9 million a year of just volunteer hours that are contributed by universities to the city. And I think that that's, that's a culture of service that our university and the rest of the university and our consortium very much share with the Rotary Club, and that is a commitment to a mission of service. We're um, a little bit unusual in that regard, even within uh, Washington. Uh, our largest employer for the past three years in a role for graduating seniors is Teach for America. And we are, we've been ranked for two years in a row, three years in a row now, as the uh, largest single contributor to the Peace Corps, Peace Corps volunteers of any university of comparable size. In fact, we contributed 72 Peace Corps volunteers just this past year, and, and in doing so, we passed the 1,000 mark. We just celebrated uh, the 50th anniversary of the creation of the, uh, of the Peace Corps this past fall. And, uh, and in that period, we've had uh, over 1,000 uh, volunteers who have uh, gone on to serve in the Peace Corps. In a way, that's not too surprising because we're a university known for, because we are in Washington, known for an interest in policy, in having an effect on the world. We tend to blend theory and practice in a way that I think is, a, is a quite a hallmark of our university. Uh, but at the same time, we've uh, taken a turn that you might find a little bit surprising, which is that we're increasingly becoming a university focused on research, really across all of the academic fields, 
but with an increasing emphasis as well on science and engineering. And I think that's surprising to people who have been in Washington for a long time to think of George Washington University, uh, like its fellow universities here, as interested in law and business and politics and so on. Uh, and you might ask yourself, why are we investing in, uh, in science and technology? It's a pretty significant investment. Uh, Davis kindly mentioned uh, uh, the projects that are underway on our campus, and the largest of those that's about to be constructed is a half million square foot science and engineering building, which will be right across the street from the new Whole Foods, if you know our neighborhood. You know that our, one of our recent projects involved creating a, uh, a commercial campus uh, right on Washington Circle that has a 40,000 square foot Whole Foods store. I think that has, that's probably done more for the popularity of our university in the neighborhood than anything I've done personally, I have to tell you. Um, but, uh, but we're building this half million square foot science and engineering hall. It's going to house all of our science and engineering departments. But in addition to that, I mentioned that we're rapidly building out a 100 acre campus in northern Virginia in Loudoun County, Ashburn, Virginia. We have a number of interesting things going on there. We have um, transportation, work in transportation safety. In fact, the National Crash Analysis Center is located on that campus. We have, uh, we're doing work in alternative energy sources. We're doing work in high performance computing. We just created a school of nursing. Our la the latest of our 10 schools was launched on that campus uh, just last year. And, um, we have some interesting things that might surprise you a little bit, and I'll mention one of those, which is that we have, a, we have the largest earthquake simulator table east of the Mississippi River. This is a shake table, and it literally is a table that shakes. It's a, it's a large square metal plate that has uh, piles that drive down into bedrock about 60 feet below the floor, uh, so, that it's, uh, so the vi isolated from the vibrations of the rest of the building. And uh, we do modeling there of the effects of earthquakes. And, now, people have often asked me, why would any university on the East Coast have an earthquake shake table when we never have earthquakes? Uh, that, that question is actually easier to answer now. <laughs> and in fact, I'll tell you, I'll take a moment just to tell you an interesting story about that. My wife Diane and I live in Foggy Bottom uh, in an historic house that used to be the home of the F Street Club. So we call it now the F Street House. It's right on the corner of F and 20th Street. It's a house that was built in 1849. It's a federal style uh, mansion. And, um, and we sort of live above the store there, and we have a lot of events downstairs. I uh, hope to see some of you there. I think some of you have been there for, for different kinds of events we've had in the course of the year. Uh, and on the day of the earthquake, we were hosting a luncheon there for some of the members of our staff from the transportation department and the moving department. And because uh, we do this periodically, it was nice. It was a beautiful day, as you may recall. We were sort of having a picnic in the courtyard area of the house. And as the party was breaking up a little before 2 o'clock, one of the members of the staff turned to my wife, Diane, and to me and asked, what goes on on our Virginia campus? And I said, well, a lot of interesting things. And I went through the list I just, I just gave you. And I ended uh, with, uh, and actually my wife ended by saying, and we have an earthquake shake table. And she started sort of going like this. Um, and uh, that simulates earthquakes. And the gentleman turned to me and said, have you ever been in a real earthquake? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I lived in California for 16 years. I experienced many earthquakes, including the big one, the Loma Prieta in 1989. And the second I said that, the earthquake hit. <laughs> and he looked at me somewhat startled and said, what's happening? And I said, a real earthquake. <laughs> so, so you got to be careful what you say. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so there's a lot going on there. And I will, I will mention one uh, focus of our research, which has uh, uh, become a very important emphasis at the university, and that's our focus on sustainability. We um, have organized a number of symposia focused on solar energy, symposia focused on what the city of Washington could do to become a model of urban sustainability. We are, are really making urban sustainability our focus. Our last uh, two uh, residence halls we built were both gold lead certified. And we are really making a push in this area. We've created an Office of Sustainability. And our motto is that we want to practice what we teach in this field. So we're not just doing academic work, but we're trying to model sustainable development on our campus. And I think this is the benefit of the neighborhoods that we're so much a part of. And I think it, it will enable us to have a leadership role in this, uh, in this growing field of sustainability. And in fact, it's something that the District of Columbia is also interested in. And so we're working with the mayor and the economic development team of the mayor to see what we can do to enhance uh, the, and to bring industries uh, that will be job creating industries into Washington and the surrounding region in the area of, uh, of sustainability. Well, again, why research? Why is research such an important focus? And I think the answer, there are actually several answers I would give. One I mentioned already, that this really is a center of science. Uh, with an extraordinary concentration of research funding. 
uh, a lot of which goes out of the District of Columbia into other parts of the country, which we can capture in the District of Columbia if we have strong research programs in our universities. Another reason is that, as I mentioned, we're a strong policy-oriented school, but you can't have credibility in today's world in the field of policy unless you also have credibility in energy, in, sorry, in, uh, in science and technology, because so much policy these days concerns matters of science and technology. So if we're going to remain serious as a policy-oriented institution, we also have to be strong as a science and technology-oriented institution. And finally, I would say that every great metropolitan area has at its core a large world-class research university. We're a little bit of an exception in that regard. We, we, we have universities that have been involved in research, but we, have, we really need to have a, a full-dress, comprehensive research university at the heart of our nation's capital for the benefit, I think, of the region as a whole and of its economy. And I hope that's of interest to many of you in the enterprises that you're, uh, that you're involved in. Another topic I want to touch on very briefly is something that we have in common with the Rotary Club, and that is our commitment to scholarships to student aid. About two-thirds of our students receive student aid. Um, something you probably don't know about our university is we have a fixed tuition program because we're very committed to affordability. And so what you pay the first year never increases over the course of up to five years of an undergraduate education. And I think that's a, that's a little bit of a hidden uh, fact about our university. And we're often talked about as expensive because of the sticker price for the first year. But because of the financial aid we give and because of the fixed tuition, the net cost of that education is not, uh, is not what it would seem if you just look at the at the opening uh, year's uh, tuition. But we also are committed to affordability in other ways, and I'll just mention two examples. One is our Trachtenberg Scholarship Program, which is scholarships that we provide to graduates from the District of Columbia's schools. And since 1989, uh, we've provided those scholarships to 133 students for a total of $16.5 million. And we are, right nowadays, we're providing nine to 10 of those scholarships per year. We also have, of all the universities that are attended by graduates of DC schools, we have the highest graduation rate. And I'm talking not just about schools within the District of Columbia, but I'm also talking about whether it's the University of Michigan or the University of Maryland or, or, uh, or the Ivy League schools. We have the highest rate of graduation because we put so much effort into supporting the students from the DC schools who come to our university. We also have a partnership with the School Without Walls, which is on our campus, one of our far, foggy bottom neighbors. Uh, it's actually right next to our education school on, on uh, G Street in Foggy Bottom. And we, uh, a couple years ago, started an early college program which enables students in that high school, and this is a DC public high school, to, uh, in their last two years of high school, they can get two years of college credit under their belt. So they graduate from high school with an associate's degree from George Washington. That is, in effect, an additional scholarship program because we don't charge them any tuition for taking those uh, courses. And uh, we now have had uh, three cohorts of students go through that program. And one of them, who is now a, an undergraduate at George Washington, is named Sarah Hillware. And I mention her because she was just named Miss District of Columbia 2012. So we're sort of proud of that. Well, uh, Davis mentioned that we're a university almost 200 years old. We were founded in 1821, as I mentioned. Uh, so that means our bicentennial comes up in 2021. And of course, that always gives you uh, uh, a moment to think about, to reflect on where the university has been and what will we be in our third century, just starting just a few years from now. We were created, uh, and this really is true, uh, there was a vision spelled out by General Washington in his last will and testament when he died in 1799, you know, just about this time of year, actually came down with a cold uh, rather suddenly and uh, uh, died in a matter of hours. Uh, and, but he had left a, a last will and testament in which he left a provision to create a university in the nation's capital with a very specific mission. And that mission was to draw students from the former colonies so that they could come together, live and work together, form lasting friendships, and become the core citizen leaders of the new republic. The idea was to overcome their regional differences. You know, they had developed separate cultures in all the different colonies and the different regions of the country, bring them together so they could become a common uh, citizen leadership. And uh, unfortunately, when he spelled that out uh, in his will, he left the provision for creating this university in the form of stock in a canal company that was to build a canal to the Ohio Valley. Unfortunately, the one that he invested in was the one on the wrong side of the Potomac, uh, the Virginia side, because the one on this side of the Potomac actually was profitable. That one never was, so there was no money. And that's why it wasn't until 1821 that a Baptist missionary 
uh, named Luther Rice was able to raise the money and then go to Congress and persuade Congress to charter the university, and, uh, and that's how Columbia College was, uh, was initially uh, created. Well, we've continued that mission. The difference is that today, instead of bringing students from 13 former colonies, we recruit students from all 50 of the United States from, and its four territories and from 130 countries around the world. So we are continuing to produce citizen leaders, but not just for the nation, but for the world. And that's something else I think we share with, uh, with the Rotary Club. That is a commitment to international education. In March, we're going to have, in the middle of March, we're going to have our third global forum. This one will take place in Seoul, Korea. Uh, the the um, keynote speaker there will be Colin Powell, our alumnus. And then at the end of the month, we're going to be hosting the Clinton Global Initiative University, which will bring over 1,000 students from around the country where they will be focusing on service projects that they're developing for the developing world. And that will be highlighted there. And our students will also be engaged in that. And by the way, our project, our commitment to the Clinton Global Initiative is to collect 20,000 cell phones by that time, which will be cashed in, and some of them will be converted into communication devices for medical communication in Uganda. Uh, so if you have any used cell phones, or if your children have any used cell phones that you'd like to get rid of, if you can send them our way, they'll be part of that 20,000. Uh, and that'll really make a difference to uh, actually people's lives uh, in the developing world. As we think about our future, it's clear to me that we're going to have a dual focus in our third uh, century, which will continue what our identity and our mission has been as a university. And that means that we will continue to be engaged in, to be both in and of this great nation's capital of Washington, D.C., but we're also going to continue to press beyond that uh, as a global university. And I think maintaining that dual focus on the District of Columbia and on the world will be our destiny for uh, our third century as the George Washington University. And I'll be happy, uh, President Davis, to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it's, it's a relatively small percentage uh, of, the, of the district. As I said, we have nine or 10 students who would, would be getting our, our um, scholarship. You know, maybe twice that number would be coming from the District of Columbia altogether. Uh, and as you know, one of the challenges that I think a lot of us are, are really involved in, and our Graduate School of Education and Human Development is very much focused on this, is improving the rate of college going, college attendance, and college graduation of, the, of District of Columbia uh, students. But we do have a peculiar situation here where the TAG, that is the Tuition Assistance Grant, for the District of Columbia is really, by, by an act of Congress in effect, is, is directed to students who leave the District of Columbia to get education elsewhere, but it doesn't support students who come at the same rate who come to District of Columbia universities. And I think that may have something to do with the fact that we don't have congressional representation uh, in the District of Columbia, at least that's what I hear. Well, you know, I think um, I, I've, I've talked quite a lot about how um, I think there, there needs to be more careful thinking about uh, what we're preparing our students to do and what the needs of the market really are, because I think there's a lot of sort of shooting in the dark of, from sort of both directions. Uh, that is to say that we design programs without really thinking about what the needs of the marketplace are going to be, and, uh, and, uh, and there isn't a lot of communication between uh, prospective employers and students. We're trying to address that. In fact, we had a career services task force last year, and one of the things we're doing is pushing career preparation back into the earlier years, so it's not just something that happens in your senior year as you're on the verge of leaving. Now, I, I will say at the same time, since you asked about my scholarly background, I'm, I'm a professor of uh, English literature. Um, I have a strong belief in and commitment to the liberal arts. I think it's important. Yeah, I think it's important that, um, uh, that even students who are interested in going into fields like business, whatever it might be, you know, are well trained uh, in the liberal arts because I think the innovative thinking that that, uh, that, that undergirds is really critical to our economic uh, well-being. And it's a reason why, uh, despite all we hear about competition with China in education, there are uh, tremendous numbers of Chinese students who do everything they can to learn enough English so that they can come to our universities because they see that as an, as an economic uh, benefit to them to have the kind of education that you can receive in a, in, a, in a liberal arts institution in the United States. I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I, in fact, um, uh, it's interesting to mention that we actually held a jobs fair for D.C. residents in July, which was attended by something like 1,400 or so um, uh, people looking for positions, and we brought together jobs from all the uh, from the entire consortium. So we hosted it uh, at our expense, actually, but we invited all of our 
uh, fellow universities uh, in, the, in the region to come with their jobs and also their, their affiliated hospitals. We have an interest in that. I'm on the board of the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C., which is also an uh, interest in ed international education and finding opportunities for, for young people in those areas. Uh, we've been doing some work with them that's probably maybe parallel to the kind of work that you're talking about. I think, yeah, I think the answer is yes, we'd be very interested in that. In fact, I was aware that you had this because um, uh, as, uh, well, um, being in the kind of institution I am, of course, I, I, I Googled you and found your photo gallery. Not you personally. Uh, you wouldn't want to see I, that. I googled. I googled the. Uh, I googled. The, I googled the Rotary Club and you and found your photo gallery, which uh, had a number of events, including a happy hour and the um, and there were photographs of people attending your uh, your jobs fair there. So I mean your your career fair. So I think yeah, the answer is yes. My chief of staff is uh, who was introduced earlier is sitting right there and she's walking toward you with her card, and so we'll we'll, uh, we'll see what we can make happen. That's okay. great. So, so the student body, as I mentioned, is 42, uh, uh, sorry, is, is 20, uh, 25,000. Uh, tuition is a little over 40,000 for that first year, but then it doesn't go up after that, as I mentioned. Uh, and so, which is high, uh, there's no question about it. But remember, as I mentioned, almost uh, two thirds of our students uh, receive scholarships uh, for that. And uh, I, when I first arrived, the first day I arrived on campus, I met with all the vice presidents to say, we have to do something about affordability. We decided to do at that time four things, one of which was to keep that fixed tuition, Another was to increase the scholarships, uh, the funds that we were raising from our alumni and others for scholarships. And, a, and so we started something called our Power and Promise campaign, which is a scholarship campaign. A third was to reduce the amount of debt that students had to uh, accumulate during, uh, when they graduated. So the average amount of debt, we've been trying to ratchet that down. And, and the fourth was to uh, create something called Innovations uh, Task Force. The idea there is to take money out of business operations to invest in our academic programs so that we don't have to raise tuition as much to, to pay for those. And we've been below 3% in our, in our increases for the last four years in a row. Uh, so we are trying to get a handle on that. It's a national issue because we're such a labor intensive industry. So we, um, uh, well, I, I, I probably don't have the statistics to compare us to other schools in the area, but I would say it's something we've been really focused on. We uh, hi hired from Princeton uh, just this past summer, uh, Dr. Terry Harris-Reed, who's a real expert in that field, is a vice provost for diversity and inclusion. So it's something that we're making a serious uh, push on. Uh, we just, um, uh, we've been adding diversity at the senior level uh, as well as the faculty, uh, to our faculty, but there's a lot more that we have to do in that area. Uh, we had a, a university-wide council, which is going to continue to be a permanent body to advise Dr. Reed in the work that she's doing. Oh, not mainly. I think it, that's going to be a place where we're going to do the kind of science and technology work that really doesn't make as much sense to do in the heart of Washington, D.C. So I mentioned we have the National Crash Analysis Center there. Uh, so we, we do crash testing there. We, we do, we're developing smart technologies for crash avoidance. Uh, we have a large uh, uh, comprehensive, a, a large um, uh, uh, advanced computer system uh, set up there for doing work. Uh, uh, research on, uh, in fact, we, on things like reconfigurable hardware. This is uh, computers that rebuild themselves. Uh, as they, as you know, just a little bit scary in a way when you think about it, but uh, but that's happening out there. We're doing work on things like uh, uh, wind energy, you know, building wind turbines uh, that are uh, that are more efficient and that reduce the cost of uh, producing uh, 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 wind energy. We do have a nursing program out there, and that's the one the one school of the university which will have that as its primary location. Well, in fact, uh, you know, uh, ten more than a decade ago, there were there was a serious financial problem in the uh, in the medical school uh, that was solved actually by the board of trustees long before my arrival by in effect selling the hospital to United Health uh, Services and uh, spinning off the faculty practice. In other words, the clinical faculty became their own uh, separate corporation. And the result of that is that right now the university and the hospital and the faculty practice are all operating in the black. So none of them have deficits. So we're quite unusual in that regard. Now, where we have, I think, where we need to do more is building up our clinical research, which has not been a, a real focus during the time in which we were sort of working our way out of those financial problems. There was so much emphasis put on clinical care that there was not enough time left for faculty to do the kind of research that we really need to do to maintain a competitive medical center. And so that's 
that's an, an effort that's now underway. Uh, we did some reorganizing, pretty dramatic reorganizing of the medical center last year, and I think we're in, in pretty good shape moving forward. Uh, but part of that's going to involve uh, raising funds to support our physicians so they don't have to simply uh, spend all their time doing clinical care and don't have any time for research in some of the areas in which we really have strengths, which include cancer and a number of other areas. So I think the, uh, I think the medical center is uh, it's, it's actually financially in very good shape, but it can be academically stronger than it currently is. Well, um, I, I've, uh, I've actually, since arriving at uh, George Washington, I've, this will be my third visit to Korea. We have, a, we have an, a unique relationship with Korea, in part because the founding president of the Republic of Korea, Syngman Rhee, was a, was a graduate of our university. Actually, in about 1912, come to think of it. Um, and then um, uh, and the, 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 the person credited with sort of creating modern Korea, who was a man named Su, Su J. Peel, uh, who had the American name uh, Philip Jason when he was a medical student at George Washington, went back and created the first uh, newspaper that was printed in Hangul, the Korean uh, phonetic language, instead of in Chinese characters. And so he's kind of a national hero there. F partly for those reasons, we've always attracted a lot of Korean students and had a lot of connections with Korean institutions. I visited Seoul National University when I was, uh, when I was last in Korea. Um, we, have, we have exchanges, we have student exchanges with Seoul National, uh, but, but they're not formally involved in, this, um, in the event that I was talking about, which is really uh, an opportunity to bring our faculty and alumni and deans to uh, Korea for a global forum that will be drawing people from all over uh, Asia. We did this in Hong Kong. Uh, three years ago, we did it last year in um, New York City, and this is the third one we're doing. And it's, uh, these, are, these are pretty powerful and interesting events. We'll be focusing on global, the global economy, uh, world security issues, and so on. Well, I, you know, I think it's I think it's a great question. Um, I, I used to work for um, I used to be on the um, uh, uh, on the staff at uh, Johns Hopkins, and so for six years I worked for Mayor Bloomberg when he was chairman of the board of the Johns Hopkins Board of Trustees, uh, and um, and he is a, quite a visionary, I think, and by the way, an engineering uh, graduate. I mean, that was his background, and I think he sees exactly what I was saying, which is that in order to have a really powerful economy in today's uh, global economy, you've got to have science and technology um, uh, resources at the heart of the city. And so he, what, he, what he looked around and saw was that, um, you know, although uh, uh, New York is a tremendous college town, it did not have a very large uh, engineering presence of the sort that some other parts of the country did. And so he's tried to remedy that by, uh, by having this competition. You know, it was, it was Cornell versus Stanford and several other institutions that were competing. Uh, they have very large engineering programs. We have a relatively small engineering uh, school, but we're building it up, I think, partly in order to uh, fill this need, which I perceive very clearly in the District of Columbia and the region, to have uh, more uh, university-based science and technology here so that we can provide the kind of talent and the kind of, uh, of, of intellectual resources that will attract uh, technology companies and others to the District of Columbia. He's doing it to, uh, to diversify the economy of New York City which has been dependent on the finance industry, and he sees it as increasingly uh, needing to be uh, involved with, um, with science and technology. And I think we have a similar situation here. We, we're not really dependent on the finance industry, but there is something we're dependent on. It's called the federal government. And it, has, it shows every sign of uh, potential shrinkage in the coming years. And so I think we're going to need to diversify this economy. And that's one of the reasons why universities are, really are stepping up. And we have been talking to the mayor and to his uh, staff, to Deputy Mayor Victor Hoskins, the Deputy Mayor for um, Economic Development, about uh, what we can do as universities to help attract uh, the talent uh, to this region and to the city that will really continue to build our economy, especially if we need to diversify after there's a shrinkage of the uh, federal uh, budget here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Knapp, thank you so very much for coming today. I, I learned a great deal, and it's obviously a very exciting time to be at GW. You're doing a great job there, I can tell. Um, we uh, recognize our speakers uh, by uh, planting trees around the tidal basin several times a year, and this is a certificate representing our intention to do so. Um, we're going to be having our next planning in uh, April of this year, and we hope that you can join us for that. And that's a cherry tree? Yeah, a cherry tree. Well, actually. 
Um, I, I, I want to say, I'll just say <laughs> two things. First of all, I, my father-in-law would be very proud to see me get this. That's, uh, there you this, go. Uh, so that's great. Uh, but I think that, that that's, a, that's a wonderful conjunction because, as I mentioned, this is the 100th anniversary of the mm -hmm. planting of the cherry trees, the 100th anniversary of your club, right. the 100th anniversary of our university. So maybe we can celebrate all that together in we, April. We, that's yeah. what we're going to be doing, actually. That's great. Thank you very much.